Well, we all believe in ourselves. If I ask you to tell me about yourself, you'll tell me about yourself. You'll tell me a story. You'll have an idea of yourself as some kind of entity that's unified and continuous. You have a, a history, you have a present, you have an anticipated future. But it's all built around stories and, and you know, stories nested within stories. So that's the self. The kind of normal intuition goes deeper than that. The normal intuition is that there is some kind of essence or core to the self, which goes beyond the weaving of stories. And if, I, if you say to me what makes you the same person from one day to the next, I would say it's the story that makes you the same from one day to the next. Whereas if you're an ego theorist, you would believe that it's the, there is some kind of inner essence that goes on um, virtually immutably from one day to the next. And presumably you've reached this conclusion that we are storytellers rather than a, a container of a core ego is because you have seen people who have lost themselves. Yes. Who've lost a story. Well, yes, that's true. I mean, and um, Two things really. One is that when you look at the brain and the brain's functions, there's nowhere where it all comes together that you can say, well, this is the part of the brain that is the control centre, really. It's, it's, it's all over the shop. It's all over the shop. And... Different functions are distributed in different ways. And the only thing that brings it together is, well, two things. One is the body. So we're more or less the same body from one day to the next. So when you look in the mirror, it's the same as it was last time you looked in the mirror, more or less. Um, and the thing's the story. And those are two, the two aspects of the self that I think we've begun to understand a bit better in terms of how the brain constructs these ideas. Is, is there any point in asking where the stories come from or why we would choose some stories over others? Well, you have to make sense, in order to survive in the world and in society, you have to make sense of who you are and who you are in relation to other people. And although I would argue and other people would argue there is no inner essence that is the person, we nevertheless have that construct in mind. So we have to have that. In other words, I'd say I don't believe in the ego. Um, I'm more of a, a so-called bundle theorist. Uh, I think bundle theory is true. Explain ha bundle theory. Um, there is no inner, in, inner essence. We are built from language and memory. That we, From those materials, we construct a story that is consistent from one day to the next that helps us negotiate the social world. And that's what we are. That's, that's the bundle. But there is no inner essence. You can strip away strands of the bundle, and that happens in neurological disease. So people lose language ability or memory ability or perceptual skills. But the bundle rolls on until it stops. Um, but there's nothing in the middle of it. That's the, I mean, what I was about to say was that, although I think that's true, I can't really get my head around it. And I don't believe anybody really can. And I think that there's a real kind of paradox there, which is you know, the paradox of what it means to be a person. See, in, in your book, and you say this a, a number of times in various ways, you say the brute fact is there is nothing but material substance, flesh and blood and bone and brain. Mm. I know I've seen you look down into an open head, watching the brain pulsate, watching the surgeon, sur surgeon tug and probe, and you understand with absolute conviction there is nothing more to it. There's no one there. It's a kind of liberation. Mm. But you're not quite sure? No, I'm quite sure. You I, are? And I'm also pretty sure that I'll never quite understand it. That's not the same as being not sure about it? No, but it's as far as I uh, will allow myself to go, because I don't think I can go any further with any confidence. That, you know, I, I don't think there's a solution to the problem. Why do you think it's a kind of liberation? Because you, if you haven't got a, an ego or a soul to lose, you don't feel... Worry like, about losing it. You don't it. feel losing it, essentially. And if you, if, you, if you read Derek Parfit, whose ideas I essentially borrowed and developed, he says it's had an absolutely liberating effect on his own life because he doesn't fear death, for example. He knows that uh, you know, if, you, if, you, if there is no ego to lose, then you don't fear the loss of it. And he has personally found it to be quite an enlightening kind of insight. I don't think I've, you know, don't think I've reached that point. But I don't fear... Um, I don't fear death, I don't, because it seems meaningless to me to fear that in terms of the positions I've arrived at through, through neuropsychology, through the kind of philosophy I've read. I'm not sure it ever occurred to me that one would fear death because of the loss of ego. What else is there to lose? People. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. But that's, 
as someone once said, um, yeah, you only live once, if that, you know. So it focuses you on the present moment and the people around you, and those are the things that matter. And being a biological machine with no inner soul doesn't stop me doing things that matter. Doesn't me. stop you loving. No, exactly. Even doesn't. though it may be just a series of neurons doing something. No, it's not, though. Well, so, you don't agree with Francis Crick when he says we're just a collection of neurons. Well, I do, to the extent that if you peer into the brain, that's what you ultimately find. But it's through, it's through their connections and the patterns of connections that meaning and emotions arise. So he says, conscious experience is not caused by the behaviour of neurons, it is the behaviour of neurons. What he's saying is that there is nothing additional to that. There's no deeper fact about being a person. Um, ultimately, you, get, you need that biological machinery to make you tick over. Is this anything different from, I think it was Scott Fitzgerald, huh? who said that personality is merely a series of successful gestures? I don't know that quote, but it's a good one. I think I'd does kind of make, go along with that. Does yeah. that make sense yeah. to you? Yeah. But, I mean, you've, you've had case studies, and you talk about them in your book. Um, Robert, for example. You know, under ordinary circumstances, you would think that Robert was having a midlife crisis. Mm -hmm. But what happened to him? Well, he had a slow-growing benign tumour, which slow, gradually, gradually recalibrated his personality. Which is an amazing expression, recalibrated his personality. If you go down into the bar and have a glass, a bottle of wine, you'll recalibrate your own personality. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And we do it all the time. Um, so this the, was a dramatic recalibration. It was, it was dramatic, but it was... It, these things happen. Um, and you see people sometimes, actually, who go in for an investigation, um, have a brain scan because they've had a stroke, and then they discover there's a, you know, there's a tumour the size of an apple in the frontal lobes. The question is, would they ever have been the person they thought they might have been? I mean... Exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, so the brain is constantly reshaped, re, you know, reorganised through experience. Uh, we change all the time. The fact that you can change it biologically through through drugs or through yeah. head injury or whatever. I suppose that's why, I'll get back to Robert in a minute, but okay. I suppose that's why we're so sensitive about the self because we have drugs now, we have antidepressants now. Yes. That can alter our perceptions and if our perceptions are altered then are we the same people? Well, I... We, see, we feel more fragile now. We do, yeah. Um, the, but there are other ways to reconstruct the person, I think. You can do it through psychotherapy, for example. You don't have to do it pharmacologically. Well, it doesn't stop that sense of fragility, though, does it? It's still changing your perceptions, making you shuck off maybe one story and going to another story. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So, okay, so Robert decides he doesn't want his life anymore and goes and buys a guitar. At he, that's Fender right. Stratocaster. Yeah, he leaves his, his wife and kids and then um, he goes and gets a, a job in a seaside town. Which is not... Unimaginable. No, I mean, no, presumably middle-aged men do this a lot. These things happen all the time. Oh. Um, and the thing is that unless the tumour had been discovered, it would have been construed as a midlife crisis. And right. these things happen all the time. The only way it was discovered, I think, was because he started developing epilepsy. That's right. He developed epileptic fits. And as a, as a part of the um, investigative process, they found the tumour. And um, it was one that could be removed. It let, didn't leave him completely undamaged. And he wasn't the same person again. But there was some semblance of the old Robert and some insight into what he'd lost um, too late. I mean, that's, that's the really sad part of that. But, uh, the ethical dilemma, I suppose, hypothetically, if he hadn't developed epileptic fits and needed something done, yeah. if somebody had perchance discovered that he had this tumour mm. and said to him, look, the reason that you're living in a seaside town trying to play a fender Stratocaster is mm, because you've mm, got a tumour in your head, mm. do you want us to take it away? Mm. He might have said no. He might have said that, yeah. Because he liked his new bit. He yeah. liked his new self. Yeah. That's a really good point, actually. Yes, he might well have said that. The fact was, it was a, you know, it was a, it was a medical condition and needed treatment, and uh, so the ethical dilemma didn't actually arise. You've never then been cast down by the fragility of the self. Um, I 
I it, mean, obviously, you've dealt with tragic cases. Yeah. I, the, one of the first cases in the book, um, the eggshell boy story... He fell down a lift shaft. He fell down a lift shaft. 